how many of you guys have ever really wondered why God would have his own son be tested in the wilderness? Randy and I, when we were talking about that yesterday, why did God send his only son into the wilderness to be tested? Any of you guys have any thoughts on that? Just kind of holler it out real quick. Anybody have an idea of why God would send his son into the wilderness to be tested? We're tested every day. We're tested every day. Okay. Good answer. Um, why else would God send his son, whom he loved, into the wilderness to be tested? We couldn't save ourselves. To do what? We couldn't save ourselves. Because we couldn't save ourselves. Anybody else have a thought about that real quick? Yeah. The scripture tells us that, that he was he was tested in every way that we are, so he would understand okay. our temptation and our testing. So God was tested in every way that we were. So we're going to be looking in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13, and then we're going to go into uh, Matthew 4, and we're going to go through verse 7. But as we come into this, uh, 40 days that he was in the wilderness. And as I started looking in the Bible, every time that I saw 40 was a time of testing and purification. <clears throat> and you say, how can that be? Well, let's go back up for a little bit. How many days did it rain? How many? 40 days and 40 nights. And what happened during that time period? Was it not a testing for Noah? Was it not also a purification of the world? Okay, so now let's jump up a couple hundred years. And how many years did the Israelites wander in the wilderness? Forty. 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 Was that not a time of testing and purification for the nation of Israel? So when we come into this, we take a look at it. And as we come into our scriptures today, I want you guys to think that 40 is a time of testing and and purification to see what happens. But before we do that, we have to go back just a little bit, and here we have John the Baptist. And John is out baptizing people, and he's saying, you know, there's coming one that is greater than who I am, and he says, I'm not even worthy to unloose the sandal of him. But he says, I want you to know that I am not God himself, I am not the Messiah, but there's coming one, and I want you guys to get excited about that, because he is holy. And I started thinking about that, and here you have John. He's out there doing all of his things, and in Matthew 3, verses 11 to 12, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John is really saying that Man, he says, I want you to understand how important Christ is. And winnowing, you know, so we can put uh, other words in there, such as examining, inspecting. We could go in and we could say even sorting. So now uh, during this time period, he was sorting out those that were undesirable. And you say, Dave, how can you say undesirable? Oh, wait a minute. Remember I told you that the 40 time period was a time of purification and a time of testing. So, let me ask this question. Did Jesus ever sin? No. So, why did he need to be baptized in water? Dang, these are unfair questions. What are you doing to us? But why did Jesus have to be baptized in water? Think about that as I read the scriptures, and it might give us a little bit of an insight. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. <coughs> but John tried to deter him, saying, 
I need to be baptized of you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, It is not now proper for us to do this, but to fulfill what is righteous. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up from the water, and at that moment the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God <coughs> descending on him in the form of the dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Wow! So here you have John, and he says, well, well, wait a minute! And I'm sure that he knew that was his cousin. Whoa, hey, cuz, you know, not me. I'm not even worthy. The Lord, you should be baptizing me. And here you have that conversation that goes on. And Jesus, who was without sin, is being baptized for what? Because it says he was baptizing for repentance for sin. So I want you to understand the importance of what we're looking at here. At that moment that Jesus was being baptized, he was taking on humanity and the sins for you and I. You said, well, wait a minute, Dave. I thought he did that at the cross. He did. But in order for him to identify as the human aspect, he had to do that, to take on humanity so you and I could understand where Christ comes from. And you say, well, Jesus was baptized, so we should follow his example. Wrong answer. Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all of a sudden, he's not that we are equal with God, but God has now accepted his role as humanity. And he, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is putting himself at the same level as his subject. How many kings do you know that would do that? I can't think of any except Jesus Christ. And so he is being baptized at that very moment. And when he does, he's taking on and identifying himself with humanity. J. Bernie McGee said this, it was not the pattern for us to follow. Christ was holy, and Christ still is holy. I want to add that. He did not need to repent. Would you guys agree with that? So he did not need to repent. You and I do need to repent. He was holy, he was harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. He was baptized to completely identify himself with you and I, humanity. Wow, have you ever thought of that before? That God himself now is identifying himself with us. How else can he do that? You know, you guys, when I asked you, why was the Lord led into the wilderness to be tempted? Because we are tempted. And I have a thought here. He was led into the wilderness for 40 days. And I want you to know because he was being led into the wilderness for 40 days. And if you go to Luke chapter 4, and it says, And Jesus Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit when he went out into the wilderness. Wow! He was full of the Holy Spirit. So you had the Trinity of God, the Elohim. You had God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit of God just descending upon Jesus Christ in the form of a dove, representing the Trinity of God. And here, God himself is taking on humanity to identify with us. That's why he was baptized, was to take on what he was being commissioned to do. And then in chapter 4 of Matthew, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. Well, Dave, I thought the Lord didn't tempt us. I thought God does not tempt us. That is true. God does not tempt us. But he will allow us to go through things in our life. And as I said, if you go to the book of Luke, you will find out that it says he is full of the Holy Spirit when he goes out to the wilderness. Randy and I, we were talking yesterday. Why was Christ himself sent out to be tempted? Why was he sent out to be tempted? 
You guys have given some pretty good answers. And I have a thought along with that idea. If Christ himself was sent out to be tempted, and Randy and I were talking about things that we know ourselves, <coughs> that would be subject to be tempted for us. We all have our own temptations. Am I correct? Whether it's eating uh, 15 tacos from uh, Alejandro's taco truck, you know, uh, down the road. Good tacos, by the way, $1.25. You know, you can go get those tacos, and they're so good, the Asada tacos. Somebody else may not be tempted to eat 15 of them. Somebody else may not even like tacos. But you throw seized candy in the mix. A pound of seized candy. I'm there. You guys understand what I'm saying? You and I all have different temptations that we face. Things that I face as temptations in my life would never bother you. Things that you are tempted by would never bother me. I would not be one to be prone to go out and eat sushi. Um, Dave, you want to go to sushi? Uh, I'll pass. I'll pass. But you throw Mexican food in the mix, I might be tempted. You throw pizza in there and you say, Dave, quit talking about all this food. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Because he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And I have in my own mind that he was tempted every single day that he was there. And you say, Dave, how can you prove that? I can't. But if he was to be tempted in every fashion that I was, he was going to be tempted in greater detail than what I would have ever faced. Am I correct in what I'm thinking? So for 40 days, he's out in the wilderness, and he's being tempted. And as he's out there, he is now identifying again with humanity. And in verse 2, after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go back to Genesis. Isn't that what he told me? It did God really say that? So here he begins to put doubt in his mind. And Jesus is being tempted in every fashion that you and I have ever been tempted. It could be money. It could be fame. It could be fortune. It could be, um, you know, whatever it is. My son bought a, a Triumph motorcycle the other day. And it's in his garage. It's a nice bike. I am not tempted to ride that thing <coughs> in the least little bit. It's a crotch rocket. If he wants it, he can have it. I do not want it. But here's the temptations that comes in, and the temptations are real, and Jesus is facing these temptations. So after 40 days of him being tempted every single day, the tempter comes to him and he says, If you are really the Son of God. And then he heard Jesus' stomach growling, and he says, If you are really the Son of God, command these stones to become bread for you. Man, let's see if, you're, if you are who you say you are. And the devil already knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. But he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Wow. You have to remember that Jesus himself was there when the book was written. He was there when every chapter of the Bible was written. He was there all along the way in the beginning of time. Jesus Christ was there. And he quotes scripture back to the devil. And see, the devil came to him with a physical need. He says, well, I know you're hungry. Man, how long can you go without eating? Well, I can go from about 11 to 12.30. You hurry up, you don't have to make it down. <laughs> See, sometimes you and I, we don't realize what Christ went through. <laughs> I knew a guy, and he would fast for 40 days. 
He would drink carrot juice, and then he would tell me, you know, well, I fasted for 40 days. And I said, well, you know, Charlie, you're still drinking carrot juice. Well, you know, that doesn't count. And he would always want you to know how important it was for him to fast. And he did it like once a year. Lost a little weight too, you know, but, you know, here's 40 days that he was out there and being tempted. And Jesus himself turns around and he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. Remember the, uh, how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to humble, ah, we were talking about that this morning in Sunday school, to humble you. So Christ himself is being humble. Ah, oh, wait, he took on the form of humanity. If you're God and you take on the form of humanity, isn't that humbleness? So he goes on and he continues to quote, to humble and test you in order to know that what was in your heart. Wow. So Jesus had to go through this testing, and then he goes on and says, um, whether or not you would keep this command, he humbled you, causing you to be higher or hungrier, yeah, hungrier, and then feeding with you with manna, which neither of you nor your ancestors had known to teach you ah, that man does not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. Wow, the devil kind of backed up and said, oh, okay. But you have to realize that if Christ is who he said he is, then for 40 days he was under every type of temptation that you and I would have ever faced. Because his temptations would have been far intense during this time period. And he comes by and he says, at the end of 40 days, man, dude, you're hungry. Man, it looks like you've not eaten too well. And Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone. Randy and I, we were talking, um, 39 stripes, 40 was death. Wow. So all this now comes into play, and the devil comes back and he says, well, you don't know, lost that round. Lost the spiritual test. You know, but, well, lost the physical. Now let me try to attack you spiritually. Isn't that exactly how the devil comes in and tries to tempt us? By physical, spiritual, and by power. So he comes in. It says in verse 5, Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up into their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And what the devil was actually doing was trying to quote a scripture that was in Psalms, but he was taking it and he was twisting it. And what does Christ himself respond back to the devil? See, if you and I do not know the word of God, then how are we going to be able to fight the enemy whenever he comes against us? And Christ says, he actually repeated Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. He says, Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take the oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. And his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. And in verse 16 is really where he gives the devil that stab right there. He says, do not put the Lord your God to test. He says, in other words, we are not supposed to come and test the Lord God, except in one area, and that's in Malachi chapter 3. And you guys can go through and read it yourself. Because God says that we can test him in that one area. So here he comes by and he says, Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to test. Because the devil is twisting scripture. Isn't that exactly what happens to us? Scriptures are twisted. Well, the Bible says, you know this, 
And it says, go and do likewise. We can't just take one portion of Scripture and say that's what the Bible says because we have to look at the content of what it is. Because if you did that, Judas hanged himself. Go and do likewise. That's taking scriptures out of context. Do you see what I'm saying? So Christ himself comes in and he says, wait a minute, he says, God himself says, you should not test me in this manner. The devil said, well, strike two. That was after his 40 days of temptations that he went through. <coughs> then he comes on in. In verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the splendor. He said, I will give you all this if you will bow down to me. Wow. If you will only bow down to me, I will give you all this. Dave, are you saying that the devil actually had kingdoms? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. And so the devil says, I will give you all these kingdoms of the world if you will bow down to me, representing power. Physical, spiritual, and now power. Don't we all desire those things? So he's trying to appeal to them. And Jesus goes back to what he had said in Deuteronomy. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you into the wilderness for 40 days? He says, you know what? He says, okay, I'm going to quote some, some more scriptures for you. He says, I want you to know that I am not to bow to anybody other than my father. And evidently, that worked. Why? Because it says the devil left him. But I want you to know that because of who God is, for 40 days he was fasting. For 40 days he was under stress. Not, well, stress as you and I would think about it. He was under psychological temptations. Power, hunger, physical. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And it wasn't until he had fasted that he had faced his greatest temptations that everyone would ever experience. And he passed this test. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords was sent to the wilderness to prove to the devil that he would not bow. And God, in his infinite wisdom, said, I want my son to take on the form of humanity. Why? To show you that we don't have to give in to what the devil wants. You want change in your life? Fast. You want to see God answer his prayer? Fast. And pray. We were watching a thing when we were over at the coast or something to that effect. <clears throat> and something said that they have this new diet that you go for hours without eating. I said, well, I do that every night. I go from about 7 o'clock till about noon the next day. I'm good to go. And it's supposed to make you healthier. But whenever you fast and you ask God and you're serious about it, God is answering prayer because of our prayer and our fasting. And I'm not even saying that we need to fast for 40 days. See, oftentimes we think of the fast of going without food. But whenever I fast and I pray, I'm giving up the desires of the flesh, whatever it may be. Say, God, I'm serious about my commitment to you, and I want to see this change in my life. God, I'm giving this up. God, I, I want change in my life. Well, Jesus was led to the wilderness to 
to prove to the devil that he would never bow because God is who he said he is. Christ himself was led into the wilderness so that you and I could put ourselves in a position to recognize the King of kings and Lord of the lords. Humble himself, taking on the form of humanity. Man, if I was God, I wouldn't do that. How many of you would do that? Not me. Man, that God allowed his only son to take on everything so that you and I could recognize the humanity of God. Perhaps that's why the shortest scripture of the Bible, Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. He wept so that he could show us the humanity of God Himself. You say, Dave, I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. But God did take on the form of humanity for you and I. <clears throat> and at that time period, after the 40 days, God says, I want you to know that you have proven. And God himself knew that his son would not bow. But he allowed his son to go through that testing for you and I. Because without that, as you said, we go through things in our life. How can I trust a God that has not been where I'm at? But he allowed his son and his infinite wisdom to go through those things, not for himself, but he did it for you and I. Wow. And that's why Christ was baptized. That's why he was led to the wilderness. It was not for himself, but he was led there for you and I. It takes on a whole new meaning. That's what we go through. If you would stand with me this morning. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking into the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. I told you that end of last year that I wanted to spend more time with God this year. It's my desire to draw closer to God this year. It's my desire to be closer to God tomorrow than I am today. The only way I'm going to be able to do that is by seeking God's face. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you humbled yourself and took on the form of mankind You're still holy. You're still righteous. But God, you did it for us. Lord, you were baptized not because you needed forgiveness, but you did it for us. To identify yourself and accept the call that you had been given to come to this world to save us from our sins. Lord, I ask that you would help us to live life in our communities and let Jesus be reflected wherever we go. Lord, I know that we still have hang-ups, we still have habits. God, we still have things that you want to get rid of in our life. But God, we ask that this year Lord, that we all draw closer to you. And Lord, as we give up things that have kept us from that closer relationship, Lord, give us something better to replace it with. Lord, give us you and help us to turn to you when we're going through our 40 days of temptations. Lord, when we're going through our wilderness experiences, God, when we're going through those times of testing and trials, Lord, help us to turn to you instead of the things that the world would want to offer us. 
Lord, I thank you for who you are. And Lord, I ask that you would be lived in our community, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.